they grew up witnessing a rapidly changing climate. I always talked about climate change with my friends at the lunch table. Like, I was like the weird weather kid. <laughs> we grew up and seen this everywhere. We want to organize and spread the message that this is urgent and like this is our time period. Now, this generation is coming of age. We lived here and it's getting worse. I get lightheadedness and dizziness and, and it sucks. The climate crisis makes racial injustice more unjust. It makes poverty more brutal. Our generation is able to make those connections. I think that's what gives us strength. But can these young activists mobilize the nation? Every one of us standing here has an opportunity to reject the climate apocalypse. In what they call a race against time. That is insane. I kind of wish I could unsee what I saw now. They're trying to scare people. Children today uh, have this anxiety about a climate crisis. And you're saying it's unfounded? It is absolutely unfounded. It's like you're in a void that no one can hear you. Like you're screaming about something, but no adult is paying attention. These are our lives, this is our future. We are already reaching tipping point, and time is ticking. My name is Jerome Foster II, and if you're wondering why I'm out here climate striking, it's because I'm a part of a movement called Fridays for Future, and around the world, we are climate striking to save our future. We are striking from school because no adults are taking climate action seriously. We need our elected governments, we need our elected officials to take climate action seriously, and that we will continue to strike here every single week until our demands are met. Climate, climate justice, justice now. now! Climate justice now! Climate justice now! now. 18-year-old Jerome Foster II first learned about climate change at age six after attending Earth Day 2008. He's a part of a generation of activists that's grown up understanding that they will be faced with the environmental consequences of a changing climate. Activism wasn't my first priority because like that wasn't really what I wanted to do. Like I was actually very like shy and like <laughs> I was nothing like this when I like when I was like in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And I always talked about climate change with my friends at the lunch table. Like and I had like four friends because everyone was like stop talking about climate change. So like from a young age I tried to to do that. And I was like the weird weather kid. <laughs> in oh, school. you were that kid. <laughs> yeah, I was the weird Wait, kid. So how how old were you? Like what grade were you in when you were having sixth. climate change conversations at lunch? I was in sixth grade. When you see that your future, there's like a ticking time bomb right in front of your future and that you don't know what's gonna happen. It's like you're in a void that no one can hear you. Like you're, you're screaming about something, but no adult is paying attention. These are our lives, this is our future. Like, and it's, it's crazy. We need a Green New Deal and we need a Climate Change Education Act. <laughs> Jerome was one of the activists who organized the 2019 Global Climate Strikes where young people around the world left their classrooms to demand action on climate change. Climate change is not alive. Do not let our planet die. According to a 2019 poll, around one in four teenagers have participated in a walkout, attended a rally, or written to a public official about their views on global warming. Like if we hadn't skipped school, would they have just continued to ignore us? If we hadn't had 11 million young people around in 140 countries come out and strike, would they just not care about the future? How much do we have to sacrifice? How much do we have to continue striking before they start taking action? And that's the real question we're trying to ask. We are racing against time. Like we'll start to see increased disasters like we're seeing now. We're seeing stronger storms, stronger droughts. We want to organize and spread the message that this is urgent and like this is our time period. Because we will keep saying like children's children, but like that, is, that was 50 years ago. So like we're the children and we're already seeing this happen. Young people are very concerned about climate change. They're gonna be here longer than everybody else and they're looking longer into the future. We are way overdue in cutting the pollution that's driving the climate crisis. Many of these actions can be re reversed and we can start using the Clean Air Act and the energy laws the way they were supposed to be. But you'll never get back the lost time. Young people have the most at stake. There's no question the kids are really hot about this. 
driving through the Permian Basin in West Texas, and this is one of the most productive oil and gas fields in the entire world. Um, and in many ways, it's thought to rival Saudi Arabia. This is the Saudi Arabia of the U.S. The Permian Basin covers more than 86,000 square miles, and due in large part to hydraulic fracturing, or fracking, was responsible for over one-third of the total U.S. oil production and over 16% of the country's natural gas production in 2019. Oil and natural gas production are expected to bring the state $2.86 billion in taxes in 2020, nearly 9% of the state's general revenue. So I, I live in El Paso, it's three hours away from here. I've driven by, you know, I-20 many times in my life, this highway we're on right now, but I'd never really understood the gravity of what this region means to the world. And the fact that it's connected to my hometown, it's heavy. It's heavy to realize that, and it just um, propels me to do more. Miguel Escoto is a 23-year-old climate activist from El Paso, Texas. He's working to raise awareness about health impacts facing residents of his hometown, caused by refineries receiving fossil fuels directly from the Permian Basin. I'm going to take a quick look at this site. It's another one with a vapor recovery system. Okay, sounds good. Whoa. Yeah, she's checking it out to see, to see how bad it is. I consider myself a climate activist. I work uh, as West Texas Field Associate with Earthworks, and I'm learning a lot from Sharon Wilson, who has spent years out on the field documenting what's happening in West Texas in the Permian. Earthworks is a nonprofit dedicated to protecting communities from the environmental impacts of mineral and energy development. At fracked gas well sites, they document volatile organic compound emissions, as well as runaway methane, which is approximately 87 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. Sharon, so the rotten egg smell, that's the sour gas, right? Hydrogen sulfide? 10-4. 10-4 is correct in trucker top. Sharon taught me that. <laughs> Copy that. And, and what are you learning from your elders, so to speak, right. uh, when it comes to how to tackle this seemingly intractable climate crisis? The climate justice fight, in many ways, is not, is not new territory. We stand on the shoulders of social justice movement giants. There's so much that we can learn about past generations, and I, instead of blaming them, am excited to keep learning more about how other struggles have won. That is, can you read that, 597? 596. Miguel is just fabulous. He's very, very young, but he and I just are in sync. He learns from me, and I learn from him. And there's a lot of give and take. Young people are very concerned about the climate. Yeah, there's a lot of despair for young people. I understand their anger. I echo that anger. And I regret their anxiety that they didn't get to grow up in, with that freedom that we had, where we didn't have that worry about would there even be a future. Is this generation that's just now coming of age the generation that's going to fix what prior generations ostensibly created? Um, I think we have to fix it to together. It's not an easy problem to solve. We now have a lot more people with us. So for, for decades, the oil and gas industry, they spent a lot of money denying climate science. So now we have more people who are aware, who are coming along with us. And I'm glad that the younger people are here.
Well, are you excited about your first time going out at night? I feel like I feel like I'm I'm a spy. I feel like I'm on a mission. The fact that it's at night feeds into that, but very excited. Okay, we're gonna turn right up here where this. Let's see. I think it's. Sorry. Here, here, just pull right across their driveway. Got it. Okay. Right here. This is good. Okay. Well, this site does not disappoint. The Trump administration is about to roll back one of President Barack Obama's signature policies on the environment. And you know, I just approved a lot of pipelines going through Texas and other places, and it's clean and it's environmentally better than the alternatives, you know that. The action taken just most recently is to eliminate requirements that oil and gas companies stop leaking the methane, but if you leak a lot of this methane along the way from the well, through the pipelines, to the power plants, or to your home, then you're doing tremendous damage because the methane itself is 87 times as powerful in, in warming the planet uh, compared to carbon dioxide. Sharon, how's it looking? What are you... Uh... What are you seeing here? A lot of volatile organic compounds. That looks terrifying. Yeah. It's, it's like I don't even recognize what we're seeing in here because it doesn't look anything like what I can see with my naked eye. No. And everywhere you go and look at any oil and gas facility, you're going to see emissions that are completely invisible to your naked eye. Sharon's $90,000 specialized optical gas imaging camera, which is also used by the energy and gas industry to detect hydrocarbon leakages, makes otherwise invisible gases visible. Some energy industry lobbyists argue that these images are simply heat or harmless water vapor, while climate advocates argue that they are evidence of methane emissions and volatile organic compounds polluting the air. Former Texas State Representative Jason Isaac is a director with the Texas Public Policy Foundation, a conservative think tank based in Austin. What am I seeing when these infrared cameras are trained on refineries and, and gas processing facilities? You're probably seeing the same thing that you'd see if you have a natural gas stove and you turn that stove on and before you hit the pilot light, you see that natural gas. Actually, you don't see it. You smell it because you smell the mercaptan that's added to the natural gas that we use in our homes. And that's probably what you're seeing is you're seeing companies that are uh, unfortunately have a waste product that they're trying to contain. But you're not disputing that what we probably saw was in fact methane? It, it could be, and I've, I've actually never looked through one of these cameras before, uh, but we're led to believe that this is, this is some sort of waste. Uh, is there any opposition to this kind of activism showing what is being emitted? Uh, through these infrared technologies. Is, there, is, it, is it misleading? Is it a scare tactic? Uh, it, it is a scare tactic, absolutely. You're seeing uh, some of these organizations that are promoting this and telling people how harmful it is when in fact it's really not. They're trying to f scare people so that they can control people. Uh, and it's, it's led to, as I mentioned, anxiety in children. Over 50% of the children today uh, have this anxiety about a climate crisis. Uh, you know, we're more at and you're risk saying for, it's unfounded? It is absolutely unfounded. We're better off by every measurement. And, and that's what it boils down to, is they want to stop the, the production of energy here in the United States. And it's really an anti-American policy. We used to be the leader of the world when it came to solutions and justice. At least we talked about it. But now we don't even talk about it. We're just saying we're not going to fight for it at all. And that's not American. America is a country about really championing pushing forward and being a leader. And that's what like our generation is like, being patriotic, people try to say that we're not patriarch or, or socialist, but what we're talking about is actually American ideals and living up to our American ideals.
I always like was going into the, like the forest and creeks with my dad. There we go. We got some rocks. This is a beautiful rock. This is a beautiful rock. We got a rock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just like going out and exploring nature, so I had that footing and like like baseline of like understanding what what the environment was. My parents weren't climate activists. They just cared about the environment and wanted to go outside. And through my backyard, I went out and explored. Right there. There go. This fall, Jerome enrolled at Pace University in New York City, where he's studying computer science and specializing in artificial intelligence and virtual reality. His goal is to use emerging technologies to tell immersive 360-degree stories to address environmental and social justice issues. Are they trying to set up anything nice in New York City for a protest at all? Yeah, on the 25th we're doing a march for, against environmental racism. What are you all considering is as environmental racism? Environmental racism is saying that black and brown people are disproportionately affected by climate change. So when we talk about environmental racism, it's saying that people around the world are actually being impacted by climate change worse because they're feeling the effects of climate change first and worse, but they, they, they polluted the least. How important is it for you as a person of color to be raising these issues? Because as you say, it is communities of color that are predominantly feeling the impacts. And you know, a lot of climate activists, they're, they're white people. Yeah. So what role, what role do you play in all this? Being a person of color in America, you're always just seen as like, you have to work twice as hard to get the same like recognition. Like, it's hard to do that. And being a young person too, it's like, you're not taken seriously. Like a high school. Check, check, check. You've got three checks against <laughs> Exactly, you. yeah. Like I spoke at the United Nations High Commission on Human Rights and no one took me seriously. I was in there, I was like, I was a speaker. And everyone was like, how is this kid on a panel? And like, why is he there with like adults? And like, and I spoke there and everyone was like, oh wow, we didn't even know like you could, you could t speak so well. And I was like, why? Like, is it because I'm young? Is it because I'm black? Is it because like I'm an environmental activist? Like, what is it? It's like, even though I'm not the most disenfranchised person in America, but injustice is injustice. And if you feel some injustice, you know how it feels. Hey, Sophia. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I just wanted to call you and just like update you on like the, the campaign one minute is going to start on the 22nd. If you guys have like in the lead up to the 2020 election. Jerome founded an international youth voting and advocacy organization called One Million of Us. Its goal is to register one million young voters for the 2020 presidential election and beyond. I interned for Congressman John Lewis um, from February 1st of 2019 to June of 2019. So these are recommendation letters that Congressman John Lewis wrote um, for me. And they're all individually signed, which is insane to me. Um, he wrote about the work that I did at One Million of Us, and it says, for these reasons, I believe that Mr. Foster's potential and passion would make him an excellent addition to your classic community, and I hope you give him your full and fair consideration. And just like, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, insane that. And after being a part of the movement and organizing over and over again, I saw that hope doesn't come from these mass mobilizations. Hope comes from action, and hope comes from elected officials actually taking these things seriously, because in the civil rights movement, the, the public sphere and the government was working together to, to create the Voting Rights Act of 1964 and create these pieces of legislation that were in reaction to mass mobilization. And now we're not really seeing that. We're seeing politicians just ignore us and it's ignoring an entire generation's call for justice and for, for accessibility to our future. And it, it's sad, but like, I, don't, I think you can't underestimate us. People are still underestimating these votes. It is hard for our generation and for our movement to think of a world that is free from fossil fuels. But it was also very difficult for, for the civil rights movement to imagine a world in which they have equality and which they have justice. And they were able to do it and, and that inspires me and I, I try to learn from them. And in many ways I try to be a voice for the voiceless. The climate crisis makes racial injustice more unjust. It makes poverty more brutal. Our generation is able to make those connections. I think that's what gives us strength. In El Paso and in many communities around the country, residents living along fence lines of fossil fuel processing facilities and refineries are exposed to harmful chemicals. You don't want to 
be on camera. Can I just, can I just film your feet and get your voice? That's fine. Is that okay? Okay. It's just the smell is getting worse. There's times when, um, this past week it's been smelling worse. Lightheadedness. Yes. Lightheadedness. My family lives all around this neighborhood. Uh, my mom's cousin lives down the street. We live right here. It's getting worse. It yeah. sucks because I'm mean, at home 24 hours a day and I get lightheadedness and dizziness and some days I just want to like sleep all day because I don't want to deal with it and yeah. it sucks. It really does. And yeah, I mean, I just I just want to offer, you know, a community for you, you know, because we're here, we're ready to help, you know, we're ready to to fight, to be, to to put, make them accountable. So I'm just a kid, I don't know yeah. what I could stop to a multi-million dollar corporation. It's like. happened in the past, we can, we can, we can. But these are transitions that government policy needs to direct. If they don't happen by themselves. We need a president and we need a Congress which is going to see the danger and see the opportunity, including the job opportunity and the well-being opportunity and choosing this cleaner path and act on it right away. There's no more time to waste. We can probably start moving everyone to this side. Okay. So that the speakers can be here. Uh -huh. What's your name? Ivan. Jaime Miguel. Ivan, Ivan. Ivan. Yeah, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We have pamphlets for you to okay. join the group. Okay. Right on that table. Ask ask Rachel right there. If okay. Testing. One, two, three. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Nice. Hello, everyone. Hello, El Pasoans. Sharon and I, we're Once we make that connection, that folks' health are at risk, and the health of their family, of their children, and of their loved ones, once we make that connection, I think we can win very easily. Because at the end of the day, no matter your political persuasion, no matter who you're going to vote for, you care about your health and the health of your family. And that's what's being attacked right now with the climate crisis. Every one of us standing here has an opportunity to reject the climate crisis, to reject the climate apocalypse, and to invest in our communities. That is what we're marching for today, and that is the fire that has to live in our bodies for the next decade. Thank you. One of the things that we have to realize as a, as a climate movement and as an environmental movement is that the climate crisis is first and foremost a human issue. It is first and foremost an issue about protecting vulnerable communities. There's no easy way to do that, but investing and promoting and valuing communities instead of industry, I think that can get us started. System change! So we're One Million of Us New York City, which is a, a chapter of One Million of Us National, which is bringing young people to create a movement to vote this November. So where we are right now with Times Square, we are chalking the vote, which is really using art to bring out our generation to feel empowered as they see art all across their community and anyone can join us right now. They can like pick up a piece of chalk and like make a cool art piece of artwork. There's like climate change, immigration, you have that education. I feel like we put them all down then they put them on the conscious because like people are probably gonna take pictures of this afterwards. Yeah, like young people are always out here. Like whether that's the civil rights movement or the gay liberation movement or the anti-war movement, we have been here because when we're born into these systems, we have a unique perspective that like we haven't lived in these systems for 40, 50 years and been accustomed to the norms. We are coming in and saying, these norms are wrong. The system isn't working for us. So we want a system that's actually gonna work for young people and work for our generation as we come into power over the next 10 to 20 years. And like, young people have always been leaders of change. Like we've always been out in the streets. We've always been pushing the envelope because we want our future to be better. Hey, 
Hey, thanks for checking out CBSN Originals on YouTube. If you want to watch more documentaries, download the free CBS News app on your phone, tablet, smart TV, or any streaming device. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking down here. Thanks for watching.